go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for being here today at our research seminar. Um, my name is Cinnamon Moffat and I'm the research program manager here at Hatfield Marine Science Center, which is the coastal branch of Oregon State University located in Newport, Oregon. Um, for those of you in the room, they know that because they're sitting here, but for those folks that are online, uh, thank you so much for being here and being a part of this conversation. If you have, for those folks online, if you have any technical issues or you have any questions for our speaker, please go ahead and put those into the chat. We have two volunteers here that will help monitor those questions and deal with any technical issues. So thank you to Rose and Roseanne who are here today to help with that. For folks that are in the room, um, if you have questions for our speaker at the end, please just raise your hand and we will bring you a mic so you can ask that question. Um, our speaker today, as you might have noticed, is primarily remote. Um, and so he's going to be sharing his screen in just a moment. And um, we're excited that he is able to join us. A uh, couple quick announcements before we get started. I wanted to let you know that next week um, on December 8th, our seminar is Lori Whitecamp, who is a research, uh, research fisheries biologist with NOAA here at Newport. Um, and she's going to be talking about the 2022 IYS High Sea Survey. So we get to get a little bit more information about that. And Lori is an amazing speaker if you haven't heard her before. So hopefully you'll come back for that seminar on December 9th or 8th, excuse me. Um, I also wanted to let you know that seminar for winter is pretty much booked, except for the next three ones that are in January. So January 5th, 12th, and 19th, I'm still looking for seminar speakers. If you have any recommendations, thoughts, let me know and we'll get those booked. Um, also wanted to let you know that because of the weather in Newport, there's not a lot of folks in the room, but we are recording today's event. So if you have somebody who's like, hey, I was going to go to that, what happened? Um, go ahead and let them know that it's recorded and it's on the past seminar page. And that should be up in a couple of days so you can share that as well. Um, today's speaker was actually invited by one of our own uh, postdoc, Alex. So I'm going to hand this off to Alex so she can introduce today's speaker. Awesome, thank you. Um, I'm really excited today to introduce my former lab mate, um, Ken Zillig, who is currently a postdoctoral scholar in the Fish Conservation Physiology Lab at UC Davis, um, which is actually where we met. He did his bachelor's at Carleton College in Minnesota um, and his PhD in ecology at UC Davis. Um, he single-handedly made the third chapter of my dissertation happen. Um, so he's a very talented researcher, um, and his interests are in conservation biology, aquatic biology, and physiology. Um, and as you'll probably see today, his research revolves around the role of temperature and subsequent temperature change in driving ecological dynamics and how those processes influence species of conservation concern. Um, and with that, I will let him take it away. All right. Uh, thank you, Alex, for that. Uh, that was great. Um, yeah, so I'm Ken. Um, thanks for coming to my talk uh, entitled Conservation Physiology of Anadromous West Coast Fish. And I wasn't expecting Alex to introduce me, uh, so I had an introduction slide of my own, but I'm just going to skip that uh, and move on to the outline for today's talk. Um, yeah, so um, the work I'll be presenting today is primarily uh, research that was done as part of my dissertation that revolved around Chinook salmon, um, as well as some other work I did early on as a grad student around green sturgeon. But the general outline, um, we'll start with a you know quick primer on salmonids as an endangered group of uh, fishes, and then we'll move on to questions of interpopulation variation and what sort of environmental drivers may um, be associated with the variation that we see or don't see amongst uh, salmon populations. Uh, third, we'll talk about um, variation um, again, again, again amongst populations, but this time um, whether or not associated with different seasonal life history uh, phenologies. And then finally, um, a discussion of potential conservation conflict with uh, another anadromous fish, the green sturgeon. Okay, so we'll start with Pacific salmonids. Um, this will work Come on, computer. Okay, I guess we're doing arrow keys. Um, okay, so Pacific salmonids are a genus under threat. Um, the Oncorhynchids are an important resource, both commercially, um, culturally, and then of course, ecologically, as they transfer nutrients from the ocean into the freshwater ecosystem. 
um, but they are suffering a dramatic amount of habitat change and corresponding habitat loss. Um, this is due to things like habitat modification, channelization of waterways, uh, water diversion for agriculture, and of course dams that um, are barriers to migration and passage. Um, because of these changes, populations um, sort of throughout their range, but primarily on the southern ends, are in decline. And this is a particular concern for salmonids, that while there are, you know, several oncorhynchid species, they're a host of quite a diverse range of populations and what we might group as evolutionary significant units. And so um, declines in populations can mean the extirpation of populations than ESUs, which can be, you know, sort of dramatic losses of genetic diversity, which is a bummer. Um, with that, I'll segue to Pacific Salmonids as a genus of diversity and of interesting diversity, at least I think. Um, and this diversity is primarily uh, sourced due to philopatry amongst Salmonid populations. They show this fidelity to spawn site. Um, salmon make their famous migrations from the ocean back to the rivers that they themselves were spawned in. And this sort of spawn site fidelity um, and natal homing leads to low gene flow between what would otherwise be quite geographically proximal populations. So the low gene flow allows populations to drift and then salmon are exposed to a wide variety of environmental conditions, um, whether that's in the freshwater environment, in the estuary or out in the ocean. Um, and uh, so this habitat heterogeneity and low gene flow can potentially lead to you know, local adaptation and divergence among populations. And that is all then made further complicated by just an immense amount of plasticity that exists within salmonids um, in terms of timing of when they return from the ocean or when they uh, leave for the ocean as juveniles and how long they spend in freshwater. There's a lot of variation that exists within this group. And I uh, am by far not the first person to look at differences amongst populations of Chinook salmon, um, or not, sorry, excuse me, of salmon broadly, um, but there has been very little work on Chinook salmon. So that was the focus of my dissertation. Uh, and Chinook salmon, are the largest of the Oncorhynchid genus. They span this massive latitudinal range from these high boreal rivers in Eastern Russia and uh, Northern Alaska, all the way down to the Central Valley of California, where we find, um, where most of my work is focused and where we find um, the, typically the populations of greatest conservation concern. Um, they're really confronting sort of the, you know, the impacts of, of humans and changes on the landscape, um, as well as, the effects of climate change being at sort of this southern uh, range extent. And uh, I think this, this next picture really sort of captures the threat that salmon are facing uh, in the lower 48. Um, this is a, an image of the Shasta Reservoir just north of Redding, um, uh, which is generated by the Shasta Dam, which sort of represents the northern upper bound of the Central Valley salmon distribution. It's an impassable barrier. Um, but this reservoir, as you can see, is quite low. The bridge in the foreground there is the four-lane I-5 highway bridge across Shasta Reservoir, um, just to put it sort of, if you can, into scale. Um, so things like drought, not to mention the dam itself and the reservoir, really pose like immense threats to uh, Salmonid diversity in California. And to sort of visualize that, currently there are 31 ESUs of Salmonid uh, in California. And this includes things like the Sacramento River Fall Run or Sacramento River Winter Run or, um, you know, the Southern Coastal Steelhead and such. Um, but in about 50 years, only 17 ESUs will remain. And in about 100 years, by 2120, only eight salmon, salmonid ESUs will remain in the state of California. Only two of these will be Chinook salmon and none of them will be in the uh, Central Valley, Sacramento River water drainage. Um, so quite a dramatic loss of diversity um, in just you know, the next century. So when we think about management and conservation of salmon populations, uh, I think it's really important to consider them at sort of a population level, which led to my first research question, which is what environmental traits um, may predict physiological performance amongst a range of, of salmon populations. And so there's some past work looking at environmental traits and their influence on population physiology. Um, a really common trait is uh, that we might study is latitude. So whether you know species are more equatorial or more poleward can have profound effects on the thermal physiology of organisms. Typically, it is warmer near the equator and, and colder further away. Um, however, more local drivers can also be important, particularly when it comes to salmon. Aspects of migration 
uh, challenge such as distance or slope may be important for the metabolic capacity that fish possess um, so that they can um, complete those migrations. And then finally, we're talking about thermal physiology today. Um, and so river temperature seems like a very, you know, a really key environmental trait to look at when we're trying to explain potential differences um, in thermal capacity amongst populations. So uh, I was seeking to address sort of two overarching hypotheses with sort of subsequent predictions of each. The first is what we might call local adaptation, which is the theory that animals should be most fit or physiologically tuned to the habitats that they you know, occupy. Um, and so therefore we may expect that populations from warmer habitats will have higher acute thermal tolerances and they may exhibit faster growth under warmer uh, temperature conditions. Likewise, populations from colder habitats may exhibit faster growth at cold water temperatures than their warm water counterparts. Um, if we think about migration distance, uh, we may expect that populations that have to migrate further will exhibit a greater aerobic capacity um, to do so. Uh, a separate sort of uh, hypothesis of interpopulation variation is called counter gradient variation. And this is very commonly seen uh, in regards to latitude and growth capacity. So uh, in Atlantic silver sides, Northern populations grow faster than Southern populations when reared at the same temperature, which seems sort of counterintuitive because it's colder up North than it is down South. And so the explanation for this is that uh, as you go up in latitude, the growing season collapses um, as you drift towards the poles. And so to compensate for a shortened growing season, Northern populations grow faster um, so that they can sort of keep up with that limited growth opportunity. Um, all right, so to test these predictions, I gathered six populations of Chinook salmon um, from hatcheries across the, the lower 48 on the Pacific coast, I should say. Um, then I brought them all to uh, our aquaculture facility at UC Davis for a common garden design whereby they were acclimated at uh, three acclimation temperatures, 11, 16, and 20. And then once they were acclimated, I assessed three physiological metrics, growth rate, critical thermal maxima, and aerobic metabolism. Um, no talk on salmon would be complete without a image of the salmonid life cycle. Um, so that's what's on the left. And then on the right is a uh, plot of the water temperature in the central valley at, at, at the Nimbus hatchery um, throughout the year. And so the point of this is to show that my three acclimation temperatures here marked as the purple, red, and yellow, 11, 16, and 20, are within sort of the temperatures uh, that are, exist within the central valley throughout the year. And particularly during the period of time um, that I was, you know, growth stage of the fish that I was studying. Um, so I was focusing on sort of these late rearing, um, you know, sort of pre-smolting juvenile life stage. So that's sort of this period of time in the year when the fish are sort of beginning to out-migrate uh, and they might be experiencing this range of temperatures. So fish would come to me uh, at the aquaculture facility, as I said, and I would split them into their three acclimation groups. Um, 11, 16, and 20. Uh, then they would grow um, for a periods of weeks um, until they were of size for my latter uh, physiological experiences. But during this time, I'm taking um, biweekly measurements of length and weight so I can assess growth rate uh, of each population under each rearing condition. And then once they're at size, which is approximately 20 grams, I conduct measures of CT max and metabolic uh, activity. So we'll start with CT max, just give you a quick primer on these measures. Uh, CT max stands for critical thermal maxima. Uh, it is a measure of the acute upper thermal tolerance of an organism. So fish uh, are placed into a beaker that is then surrounded by a water bath. Uh, we heat that bath so the fish are exposed to a increasing thermal gradient until they lose equilibrium, at which point we rescue them from, from the beaker and we take the measure, uh, the temperature measurement of the beaker uh, and that is the CT max, easy. Um, it serves as a really rapid assessment of acclimation capacity and respond to, response to rearing temperature that can assess sort of the um, physiological um, state of a fish. Um, my other metric, my final metric was metabolism. Uh, I measure all my metabolism through oxygen consumption um, via intermittent flow respirometry with the fish in swim tunnels. Um, so a swim tunnel is just a treadmill for a fish, um, and the uh, intermittent respirometry means that the oxygen is being controlled so that we can, uh, here's an oxygen trace, so this amount of oxygen in the water over time, uh, 
And we can see that the fish absorbs oxygen and then the computers release more water and bring the oxygen back up. And so we're interested in these periods of time where the tunnel is sealed and we can detect the decline in oxygen. And that decline in oxygen is the metabolic rate of the fish. So I measure two metabolic rates on each fish, a routine or resting metabolic rate and a maximum metabolic rate. Uh, the resting metabolic rate or RMR is um, an attempt to capture what is the energetic cost of just keeping the lights on? What is sort of the minimum oxygen consumption necessary to maintain bodily homeostasis? Um, that is, we conduct that overnight when the fish are most quiescent. And then in the mornings, I turn the tunnels on um, and we force the fish to swim to exhaustion. Um, and then somewhere within that swimming exercise, they elicit a maximum metabolic rate that we can then go in and assess. So that's how we get the MMR. Um, these two traits, the RMR and the MMR, serve to quantify an overall aerobic metabolic budget. Um, so that's what's represented here by this white box. Um, the RMR down here sort of sets the maintenance cost level, how much energy is just being used, as I said, to keep the lights on, while the MMR sort of sets the upper scale of this box, which is the limit of their aerobic capacity. Um, so somewhere between there, we take the difference between the MMR and the RMR, we get the aerobic scope which theoretically is the amount of aerobic metabolic capacity that a fish has to use for anything else it needs to do. So that include digesting a meal, um, or in the case of, of salmon, maybe out migrating or changing its gill architecture to transition to salt water or fighting off a disease. All these things require energy and the aerobic scope is sort of the budget for those actions. To give you an idea of what these metabolic data look like, and we'll look at some of these again in the, in the future, but um, I conduct these metabolic measurements across a range of temperatures. So fish are acclimated to three temperatures, 11, 16, or 20, but then I test them at a whole range of temperatures from eight to 25. Um, so each fish produces an RMR, which is one of these purple dots, and then an MMR, which is one of the teal squares, and then I can take the difference to get an aerobic scope. And so I can measure this energy budget across a range of temperatures to see how it changes with environmental, you know, the local, the acute environmental condition. Um, aerobic scope typically has one of these sort of humped arched shapes. And so that means that somewhere on this curve, there is an optimum, a temperature at which the aerobic capacity for that fish is maximized. Um, so we would consider this a, you know, in a perfect world, an excellent temperature for an organism. It is the temperature at which it has the most energy budget to allocate to whatever you know, survival mandates, digesting a meal, evading predation, et cetera. Okay, so then we'll turn to the populations. So as I said, I studied six populations of Chinook salmon in the study, um, ranging from the Priest Rapids hatchery up on uh, uh, the Columbia River, all the way down to the Feather River hatchery uh, in the Central Valley of um, California. And then two coastal organ hatcheries, which I'm pretty sure Newport is like right in the middle of between the Trask and the Elk River um, uh, populations. Okay, and then uh, I part of this question was to assess their physiological performance against environmental variables prescribed to each population. So I had to gather a whole bunch of environmental data. Um, so we gathered latitude of the hatchery. Um, then I was able to determine the migration distance from the hatchery to the ocean, as well as the vertical change um, that fish would overcome in that time. Then there was uh, river temperature. Um, and so using my collaborator's excellent, excuse me, temperature model, Alyssa Fitzgerald uh, produced this excellent uh, model that allows me to estimate the mean average temperature of like every river kilometer in the, in the Northwest. Um, so using that uh, and the uh, known rearing ranges of my populations, we were able to assess the annual maximum, annual minimum, uh, as well as the average and maximum temperatures that fish would experience during their specific to their rearing period. Um, not only were we able to measure those temperatures as the fish where the fish are now, but we attempted to measure or estimate those uh, temperatures for where fish were historically. So most hatcheries, are near or directly adjacent to some sort of impassable dam or water impoundment. Um, and so we were able to measure the current habitat as the habitat that wild rearing juveniles would occupy currently. Um, but then we also went to an equal sort of stretch uh, length of river behind the dam um, that we 
theorized would represent close to a historical habitat that the fish would occupy. And we were able to assess the temperatures at that location as well. Um, so typically current habitat temperatures were a couple degrees warmer than their historic counterparts, um, typically due to the fact that historical counterparts are a little bit higher in elevation. Okay, so on to the results. Um, all right, so CT max. So for these plots, a lot of them will have these three facets, um, which stand for my three acclimation groups, 11, 16, and 20. And then on the y-axis will be some sort of response trait, in this case, critical thermal maxima. Um, each of these, each of the little points represents an individual fish, whereas each of the uh, intervals represents the model estimated mean CT max for that population under that rearing condition. So we can see a couple trends here. Um, one is that you, as you increase fish uh, in temperature, um, as you acclimate them to warmer temperatures, their CT max generally increases, um, which is what we expect for ectotherms. Um, their physiology, you know, as they acclimate becomes more tuned to these warmer conditions, and so they should elicit higher thermal performance, thermal tolerance. Um, but we also see differences in the amount of variation uh, in these data. So uh, at under 11 degrees, uh, there's very little variation both amongst the populations. So all these populations are sort of hovering around 28 degrees. There's also fairly little variation within population. The standard deviations of these means are pretty low, relatively speaking. As you warm fish up, both of those uh, aspects increase. So we get more variation amongst populations. So differences between populations begin to emerge under warm water conditions. And there's much more variation uh, within a given population, um, sort of implying that under this presumably more stressful rearing condition, 20 degrees, we are getting more variable thermal phenotypes out of the fish, um, which is maybe concerning if we think about a warmer future, uh, you know, whereby, you know, fish performance may become more, you know, unreliable as different phenotypes begin to be expressed. All right, moving on to environmental predictors. Uh, I would like real quick just to introduce you to these plots. They're kind of odd. Again, we have our three acclimation groups. Um, we will also have some sort of environmental predictor over here on the side. This one is the historical rearing average temperature. Um, and then what we're going to show are the associations of that trait Oh, sorry, of that environmental predictor with uh, the physiological trait, in that case, critical thermal maxima. So traits can either be positively or negatively associated, and that will be indicated as to whether the, the distribution is on the right-hand side being positive or on the left-hand side being negative. And then they can vary in sort of their significance and or strength. Um, so here's an example that uh, T, this sort of dark blue teal color represents a not significant uh, association. Um, the distribution heavily overlaps the zero line, um, but these other distributions are more uh, more positively associated, and therefore, and they are further from the zero line, and therefore they uh, are considered either weakly significant in green or strongly significant in yellow. Okay, environmental predictors of CT max. Um, so we're going to have latitude, and we're going to have our migration traits, and then we'll have temperature on both uh, from a current sort of timeline and from historical river conditions and then measured on an annual basis or during specific to the rearing period. Okay, so it's a lot of associations. Um, so a couple of things jump out from this. Um, the first is if we look at the 11 degree panel, basically all of the traits are not significant. Um, and that makes sense if we reflect back to the distributions of each population's uh, CT max measures, there's really little variation amongst the populations. And so the model has really little variation to try to attribute to any of these uh, environmental predictors. However, as we warm up, warm the fish up and we have them at warmer acclimation temperatures, we begin to see differences amongst the populations and we begin to see more significant relationships with environmental predictors. Notably, I'd like to call your attention to, to these four intervals down here that are all strongly and positively associated uh, with CT max. Um, so uh, among fish acclimated to 20 degrees, uh, we see positive associations with measures of the historical temperature, primarily during the rearing period. Um, another way of saying that is fish from warmer habitats exhibit higher CT max uh, when they are acclimated to warmer conditions. So that is all consistent with our hypothesis of local adaptation, uh, where we would expect fish from warmer habitats to have higher thermal tolerances. If we turn to focus on growth, 
Um, again, we have our three facets and then growth rate on the y-axis. We see again that as you increase acclimation temperature, you increase the estimated growth rate of a given population. Um, one oddball here is the Trinity hatchery, which is this lemon-lime set of points. Um, they grew really slowly, regardless of which temperature treatment they were reared at. Um, we don't have a good explanation for this. There's a lot of potentially anecdotal rationales for why this population grows so slowly. Um, the one I find most interesting is the Trinity River is pretty unusual as far as fall run salmon goes, as it possesses a or it exhibits a late um, out migration phenotype, whereby juveniles will out migrate up to like a year and a half after hatching, um, which is un which is unlike other fall runs that typically out migrate somewhere within the first six to eight months. Um, so it's possible that these this fish these fish I were studying. Um, they were exhibiting this phenotype and they, you know, their growth was slowed because of it. It could also be due to impacts of the hatchery um, or impacts of the lab. It remains a mystery. Regardless, it is an outlier. Um, and when we test the association of growth rate with environmental predictors, it does a lot of funky things to the resulting associations. So for that reason, I'm only presenting data that are robust to whether or not Trinity has been included in the model estimates, or in the model, excuse me. Um, so all these grayed out points are all points that would move you know, either from positive or negative or in terms of significance, whether or not the Trinity hatchery data was included. Um, so they sort of remain mysteries uh, for you know more populations to help resolve. But what we can sort of say is if we look again at the 20 degree acclimated treatment groups, we have several traits that were robust to the inclusion of the Trinity hatchery and are positively associated with growth rate. Um, so we find that, and these are all aspects of environmental temperature, whether current or historical, and we find that populations from warmer habitats typically grow faster um, when acclimated to warmer water temperatures, uh, which is again consistent with a hypothesis of local adaptation. All right, moving on, we're going to look at metabolic traits. Um, this is specifically aerobic scope over here on the y-axis. Uh, on the x-axis are going to be the temperatures at which fish are trialed. And then we are three facets for our acclimation groups. And so I'm not going to show the, the raw data. Instead, this is going to be the model's attempt to plot the association of migration distance and aerobic capacity across test temperatures and between acclimation groups. So we're going to have lines for different migration distances. Yellow will be uh, 600 kilometers and sort of dark blue will be 20 kilometers. Okay, so what do we see here? Uh, we find that among the ac uh, fish acclimated to 11 degrees, populations or fish that typically have to migrate further exhibit higher aerobic capacity than populations that migrate shorter distances, um, which is what we may expect uh, if populations are locally adapted to their migration challenge and that's being paired with their metabolic capacity. Interestingly, this relationship we find between migration distance and uh, aerobic scope evaporates as you warm, as fish are acclimated to warmer temperatures. The um, warm water population, or the, sorry, excuse me, populations when acclimated to 20 degrees um, showed really little variation in among their aerobic scope measures. So uh, consequently, the model cannot attribute that to much of anything. And so we find that, you know, all the populations sort of behave the same. This is concerning, perhaps in light of climate change, if we expect waterways to increase in temperature, and if that's having the result of reducing aerobic capacity, um, then populations that migrate further may be um, slowly sort of deprived of the aerobic capacity that was necessary and was well suited to their extended migration. All right, we'll look now at another trait. This is the maximum temperature experienced during the rearing period. Um, so populations from warmer habitats are in sort of light yellow and populations from cooler habitats are in purple. Um, so here we see that populations from warmer habitats typically have higher aerobic capacity, but that effect is most pronounced at warm test temperatures. So we can see that very well in the 16 degree group where there's a lot of difference between these two lines um, and supports the idea that populations from uh, warmer habitats have greater aerobic capacity, specifically under conditions um, that may be more like where they're from, which is warm water conditions. 
again, uh, the 20 degree group, those effects collapse, uh, and that's primarily to do to with little variation amongst 20 degree, uh, the aerobic capacity of 20 degree fish. Okay, so the conclusions from this first set of questions uh, was that physiology is consistent with our hypotheses of local adaptation. Uh, the populations from warmer habitats have higher CT maxes and faster growth rates under warm water conditions. Um, the association between migration distance um, and uh, migration, migration distance and metabolic capacity are is consistent with local adaptation. Um, and we do not find really any effect of latitude and no support for our hypothesis of counter gradient variation. Um, and this could be for a couple of reasons. Could be that latitude is this big biogeographical sort of global metric and these local traits such as, you know, whether a stream is spring fed or precipitation fed or snowmelt fed might be way more important to the thermal physiology of an organism than whether it is relatively further north or further south. Um, it could also be that the sample, you know, the range of latitude that I sampled, which is, you know, from Washington down to California, is pretty narrow and the effects of latitude on things like day length and seasonality are more muted at that you know more equatorial range and if you study populations from like Fairbanks and high up in Alaska that you might find signals of latitude that I wasn't able to detect here. All right on to research question two. Uh, whether or not uh, there are associations between different seasonal runs of Chinook salmon and their thermal physiology. So before I dive into this, it is probably important to give you all a background on the different seasonal runs of Chinook salmon uh, that we have in California. Um, there are four of them. And uh, what I found is the best way to sort of reconcile their differences is to ask the question of how each seasonal run beats the summer heat of California. Um, so we'll start real quick with this map over here. This is the Central Valley drainage of California. That's where all the populations for this part are coming from. Um, uh, we have sort of two sets of habitat here. We have the historically available habitat in red, which is now lost to rearing salmon, rearing and spawning salmon. And we have the current habitat in green. Um, the habitat is primarily lost through the installation of the California Central Valley rim dams that cut off a lot of that, uh, that red habitat. Um, and that habitat that's lost is primarily high elevation sort of montane drainages. And the habitat that remains is typically low elevation sort of valley floor, um, slow moving uh, rivers. Okay, so we have our four seasonal runs that I measured or that I mentioned, um, the fall run, the late fall run, the spring run, and the winter run. They are all each named for the season in which adults return to fresh water. So how do they beat the heat? The fall run and the late fall run they avoid the summertime heat by migrating in the fall or in the late fall. So summer, the adults come in after the peak temperatures of the summer have subsided. Um, they spawn rapidly upon entering fresh water. They historically would have spawned in this low elevation green region. Um, and then the juveniles are incubating and uh, growing throughout sort of the winter months when the rivers are still cool. And then they out migrate in the spring before temperatures get hot again. So that's how they beat the heat. Uh, if we look at spring run, spring run is an early migrating population. The adults arrive in the spring. And historically, uh, migration in the spring, um, uh, when the rivers are full with snow melt and precipitation, allowed these Sierra, uh, spring run adults to migrate into the high elevation stretches of Sierra Nevada rivers, um, where then the adults would over summer um, in you know, cool mountain pools and snow melt fed streams. And then they would spawn in the fall um, and their juveniles would either out migrate sort of in the spring or because they were placed in a really cold habitat, they could persist for an entire um, year and spawn in the, in the, uh, as a yearling in the following fall. Now winter run are the oddest and the most unique of the California uh, populations of salmon. Um, the adults start migrating in the winter months and sort of January, February, they migrate all the way up through the spring they are migrating up to these northern reaches of the Sacramento River and the McLeod River and then the Pitt River. Um, and these rivers are unique in that they are uh, spring fed um, out of the Southern Cascades and they're cold springs. So the rivers are seven, eight, nine degrees Celsius all year long, um, which allowed the fish, the adults to swim up, arrive in late May, June and spawn right as summer hit. So the fish are spawning, they're laying their eggs, the eggs are incubating 
all throughout the summer in the high, hottest part of the year, but they're kept cool by these perpetually cold mountain springs. Um, uh, this habitat has obviously been lost by the, the Shasta Dam. Um, and so these early migrating populations have become the most imperiled. Uh, so the spring run is threatened and the winter run um, is critically endangered and exists really as one remaining population, which is heavily um, managed and there's brood stocks and attempts at satellite populations um, to bolster this population um, as it, you know, it has to, instead of migrating to these cold rivers, it now has to spawn and the eggs have to incubate right south of Redding through the hottest part of the year, um, which is a real challenge. Okay, so now with a primer on the uh, runs completed, we can turn to my hypotheses. So we theorized that the thermal physiology of these different seasonal phenotypes would reflect the historical habitats of each of these runs. So we would expect that the fall run populations, which uh, are basically historically and currently relegated to the low Central Valley rivers, um, will be more warm tolerant than their early migrating counterparts, which historically accessed the high elevation, cooler habitats. Uh, therefore, winter and spring run may show reduced performance when they're acclimated to warmer, um, warmer temperatures or exposed to more acute thermal trials. So we studied four populations for these questions. Um, the Coleman and the Feather River population, which were also in the, in this, in the first set, the Feather River Spring Run, so a sympatric population of Spring Run on the Feather River, and then the critically endangered Sacramento River Winter Run. Uh, so we'll start with CT Max. Uh, we have our three acclimation groups down here on the X, and then uh, CT Max on the Y. Um, we see, like we did in the first uh, section, that as you increase acclimation temperature, you generally increase CT Max. Um, we find that the Coleman Fall Run and the Colm or in the Winter Run have really similar CT max performances. And this is sort of unexpected for the winter run that their acute thermal tolerance would be as high, um, you know, given our hypothesis. And then interestingly, we find that the two Feather River populations show this sort of shared muted response at 20 degrees. Um, they don't show the same consistent increase in CT max with acclimation temperature, um, which is just sort of, it's just interesting that they are sympatric and that they share this trait. Uh, so just hold on to that uh, for a little bit. Um, then moving on to growth rate, again, we have our three acclimation temperatures, growth rate on the Y. We see that typically for three to four populations, as you increase acclimation temperature, you increase the speed at which the fish will grow, but this is not true for the winter run. So the winter run are this gray interval down here, uh, 20 degrees of the three temperatures I measured, 20 degrees was their worst condition. They grew the slowest, um, which is a uh, totally opposite result to what we found in the other three populations, as well as the other populations from the first half. Um, all of them typically did better at 20 degrees uh, than 16 or 11. None of them uh, did this poorly as uh, winter run. Um, okay, moving on to aerobic scope. Um, here we have four facet, facets, each of them a different population. Uh, the acute swimming temperature is on the X, the aerobic scope is on the Y. And then the acclimation temperatures are now represented by color. So the cool purple is 11 and the warmer yellow is 20 degrees. So what do we find? Uh, we find that as you warm fish up, as you acclimate them to 20, as opposed to 11 degrees, their aerobic scope decreases. Um, we can see that by the fact that the yellow lines and yellow points are typically below the purple lines and purple points. Um, so there is a loss of aerobic capacity across all populations uh, in response to warm acclimation, um, which supports the idea of salmon being cold water fish. Their aerobic, uh, their, yeah, their aerobic energy budgets are suppressed um, under warm water conditions. However, the effect of this suppression, the loss of that aerobic capacity, it varies amongst populations. So the Coleman population is pretty, uh, has pretty good compensation. They don't lose nearly as much of their aerobic capacity with warm acclimation as say the feather fall and the feather spring, where the loss in aerobic capacity is much greater. Uh, again, pointing out that these two populations, the two feather rivers, show very similar aerobic um, responses. Finally, the winter run is somewhere in the middle, um, but showing a decrease in the aerobic capacity. Uh, now, if you think back to my way back to the original aerobic scope trait, 
aerobic scope slide, there was a final aerobic trait, which was the thermal optima. So remember, we can find the peak on each of these curves and measure that as the temperature at which the aerobic capacity is maximized. Um, and we can see how that thermal optima moves with acclimation temperature. We would expect that with warm acclimation, thermal optima should increase in the same way that CT max increases with thermal optima. And so we see that in the Coleman and the Feather Spring, as you warm them up from 11 to 20 degrees, the thermal optima shifts rightward. Feather Fall shows a non-significant decrease in thermal optima, which is somewhat unusual, but the most unusual result is really the winter run, um, which show this significant decline in their thermal optima, which was really surprising. Um, it's unusual for an organism to be acclimated to a warmer, to a warmer condition and to have their warm water thermal performance decline in response to that warm acclimation. Um, but it definitely further supports what we saw in the growth, um, growth study where 20 degrees was a really, you know, sort of terrible uh, rearing condition for these fish. Um, so our conclusions from this section are that seasonal runs differ in their thermal physiology. Um, in some instances, like the winter run, it seems um, consistent that their physiology matches with the conditions that their historical habitat would possess, that being those high elevation, cold spring fed systems. Um, we do not find what we would have expected amongst the spring run population. Um, we thought they would have been more like winter run, but in fact, the feather spring run are very similar in all of their, the, in the physiological traits that we measured with the feather fall run. And so that raises some new interesting questions that I do not have any answers to, um, but maybe it indicates there is a shared local adaptation between the two to some unique aspect of the Feather River, um, and that is what we're picking up. It could also be that uh, the Feather River, the two Feather River runs have become introgressed. Historically, these two populations, the spring run and the fall run, would have been allopatric. One would have been in a high elevation Sierra Nevada River, and one would have been you know, down in the Feather River closer to the valley floor. With the installation of the Oroville Dam, they've been brought together. And so there can be introgression occurring both in the wild um, or in the hatchery. And so that could have an impact in their sort of shared uh, physiology. Okay, so what are the management implications of this work? Um, oh, I'm running out of time, aren't I? Okay, so <laughs> there's possibility for uh, local adaption indicates that there could be population specific management that would be valuable. Um, we should keep rivers cold, particularly for the winter run, but it is important to look at other populations that we may want to introduce or uh, target for conservation that we tune our management actions to best suit their physiology, as opposed to trying to you know, pool uh, data from across the range of Chinook salmon to make predictions. Okay, so real quickly, I also want to introduce uh, another anadromous fish, the green sturgeon, um, it shares its habitat with the uh, Chinook salmon. Um, like them, it is anadromous, but unlike them, it is long-lived in its iteroparis. Uh, it makes its anadromous migration multiple times uh, throughout its lifetime. It's found, again, across a pretty wide uh, latitudinal range, um, but despite this huge range, it's only found in three spawning rivers, um, which are split into its two distinct population segments. We have the northern DPS, which spawns in the Klamath and the Rogue River, and the southern DPS, which spawns in the Sacramento River, and which is threatened for many of the same reasons that Chinook salmon are threatened. Uh, this raises a conservation conflict between Ch Chinook salmon, particularly the winter run, and the green sturgeon. The winter run, they spawn in mid-May to mid-June, and because they are trapped you know, right outside of Redding, there's a management action to maintain the river temperatures at approximately 13 degrees or below to protect them. The green sturgeon, on the other hand, spawn a little bit earlier, but their sort of optimal incubation temperature is 15 degrees. So we have the situation where the management action for one species may be negatively influencing the management or the conservation of the second. To highlight that, here's some data from a paper by Jamie Lynn Paletto et al. on green sturgeon, looking at the effect of temperature and feed ration on growth rate. Uh, I'll try to move this through this really quickly. Uh, we see that fish growth is greatest among fish that are acclimated to 19 degrees, but if you acclimate fish to 9, 13 degrees, all that growth capacity just collapses. Um, if you ration fish, so these are fish that are fed 40% feed as opposed to 100% feed, we can see that across the board growth is suppressed by rationing, um, but 
the dramatic decline is amongst the 19 degree fish where their growth is comparable to growth of a well-fed fish at 13 degrees, highlighting how poor of a condition 13 degrees really is. So this led to a research question for green surgeon about how does feed rationing interact with temperature to influence fish metabolism. Uh, we get a hypothesis here that reduced rations would limit the energetic resources leading to reduced aerobic metabolism amongst green sturgeon, uh, which led to the predictions that ration fish will on the whole have lower metabolic capacity. And then warm acclimated fish will have, um, will have greater metabolic capacity at warmer temperatures. However, warm, rate ration, warm acclimated fish will be most severely impacted. Sorry, I misspoke. Warm acclimated fish will be most severely impacted by rationing, which com uh, complements what uh, was seen in the growth study I just showed. To test this, we reared green surgeon at two temperatures, 13 and 19 degrees, and also at two rations, 40 and 100%. And we conducted RMR and MMR trials, those metabolic trials, similar methodology that I conducted with the salmon. All this work was done on fish from the northern population segment, although it is meant to sort of replicate fish from the southern population segment, the southern population segment are threatened, and we are only able to get fish from the northern DPS through a collaboration with the Yurok tribe, who donates um, adult fish to our brood stock so we can conduct work on juvenile green sturgeon. All right, so MMR, we have our swimming trial temperatures down on the y, or X, maximum metabolic rate on the Y, and we have four treatment conditions. Two are warm colors representing 19 degrees, and two are cool blue representing the cooler 13 degrees. All right, so what do we see? As we expected, if you acclimate fish to warmer temperatures, the uh, curves shift rightward. And so the thermal performance and thermal metabolic capacity is more warm uh, adjusted. We find that there's very little ration effect among 13 degree fish. So the two blue lines are highly overlapping, indicating ration did not have a pronounced effect, very similar to the results of the feed study. And then we do find an effective ration amongst the warm acclimated fish. We expected it would be pronounced at high temperatures, but in fact, the opposite is true. And it is at low temperatures where the effect of rationing had the greatest effect on the maximum metabolic rate of these, uh, of these green sturgeon. Moving on to our aerobic scope, uh, we find that at high test temperatures, all the fish are basically highly overlapping, a lot of variation. Um, a lot of different <laughs> behaviors going on at high temperatures. Uh, but then at cool temperatures, we find a similar thing that we found in MMR where rationing is having an effect primarily amongst the warm temperature fish, the red and the orange, and primarily at low test temperatures. If we overlay this plot, this box represents temperatures that they manage the river towards, the goal temperatures, for the conservation of winter run Chinook salmon. So this box captures data that I have for fish tested at 13.3 degrees or below. And if we compare the aerobic capacity of fish in this zone with the aerobic capacity of these fish sort of at their maximum at these T-opt values, we see that exposure to cold temperatures reduces the aerobic capacity of sturgeon by 25 to 50 percent, um, which is which you know highlights the impact of this management action for winter run salmon. Um, so our conclusions here are that feed rationing has little effect on 13 degree fish, uh, but decreases the aerobic capacity amongst fish acclimated to 19 degrees. And that is particularly true at low test temperatures. So if we return to our conservation conflict, Sacramento River is being kept uh, too cold, ration say that. It is kept cold for winter run Chinook salmon and perhaps too cold or uh, challengingly cold for green sturgeon. Um, we aren't removing the Shasta Dam anytime soon. So this scenario is, is somewhat permanent. So it forces sort of, you know, the creative solutions to resolving this conservation conflict. Um, it may be that it's important to protect habitat and other tributaries of the Sacramento River uh, that are not being managed for winter run as potential habitat for green sturgeon. Um, so in 2021, green sturgeon were documented spawning in the Feather River uh, for the first time. Um, which is maybe a, an attempt to escape um, the, the conditions in Sacramento. So the overall conclusions that we have are that fall run Chinook salmon appear locally adapted uh, to aspects of their environmental, environmental temperature and migration distance. 
different seasonal runs of Chinook salmon exhibit thermal physiology that corresponds to the historical habitats and life history strategies, and that green sturgeon exhibit reduced metabolic performance at cold temperatures, and they support, and therefore supporting a conservation conflict between winter run salmon and green sturgeon. Um, so with that, I would like to say a big thank you to my PI, uh, Nam Fungi, to my two, to our two wonderful lab managers, Dennis and Sarah, who without whom the logistics of this, these projects would have been insane. Um, current and past uh, lab mates and a whole cohort of undergraduates facilitated all this. Uh, Kaba is the aquaculture facility at which I did all this work. Um, the Yurok tribe for donating uh, green sturgeon, as well as the hatchery managers for Chinook salmon. Uh, of course, the funding agencies that supported this. And then finally, the fish, um, who arguably have the most difficult job in all of this, uh, all this research. And so with that, uh, thank you very much. And I will take any questions. Thank you so much, Ken. I'm not sure you can hear us clapping, but we were just clapping. <laughs> so thank you so much for that. Um, I want to open it up for questions, but I'm going to start with those for folks that are online. Do we have any questions yet online? Okay, if you're online and you have a question, go ahead and put it into the chat and we will take care of it and we'll read it out here um, so we can get Ken to answer. How about questions in the room? All right, hang on one second. I gotta run up the stairs, Ken. No worries. Thanks. That was a great talk. Um, unfortunately, this is a question that you didn't address in your um, talk, but you were talking about um, the difference of temperature and latitude and growth, and you were suggesting that was a shorter window. Do you think it could also be fattier food that would make them be growing faster? Oh, that's an excellent question. Yeah. So, uh, in terms, so in terms of my fish, they're all fed the same diet. Um, so there could be an interesting question of like diet assimilation. And so maybe different populations have different assimilation rates and sort of intrinsic food conversions. Definitely something I did not study, but certainly an interesting hypothesis. In terms of wild fish, so the Atlantic silver sides are the famous case study of counter gradient variation. Um, and I have no idea how their diets may change with latitude or if anyone's looked at differences in their sort of diet assemblages or assimilization. So it's certainly a good question. Um, sorry, I can't be more insightful. All right, thanks for giving it a shot. Uh, we got a question online. Okay, really cool stuff. In regards to populations behaving the same when encountered with higher temperatures, did you test in other salmonoid species to see if their reaction to increasing temperatures look the same or similar to Chinook? Uh, no, that's a good question. There's lots of work done on salmonids. They're very well studied. <laughs> um, uh, I'm trying to think about performance in other fishes in the data I've seen. Um, I'm thinking about this in terms of um, metabolism. And so uh, there are, um, one thing that seems to be shared among juvenile salmonids, thinking through the data sets that I can pull to mind, um, is that their aerobic behavior or aerobic performance seems somewhat conserved in that they can maintain really high aerobic capacity at really warm temperatures. So typically the sort of baseline assumption for the effect of temperature on metabolism should be you have some sort of increase and then temperatures get too hot. And then after that T optimum, you should have some sort of pretty steep decline. Um, and in terms of juvenile salmonids um, that I'm familiar with from, from California, so there's a rainbow trout study um, or two rainbow trout studies, um, they, they show the sort of similar temperature insensitivity that these populations show, where they can maintain really high aerobic capacity um, across their thermal window, approaching critical lethal temperatures, which is sort of unusual. Um, I hope that addressed your question. Feel free to fire back if that's not what you're asking. All right, we'll give a second here. Uh, any questions in the room? So I actually had a question for you, Ken, and I might have missed this. Um, when you were doing your acclimation at your three different degrees, um, you said that once they reached a certain size, that's when you did your testing. Did they reach different the sizes at different rates? 
So did you uh, test them at different times? Yes, so they are tested at different times. Uh, that's for a whole host of reasons, one of which is, you know, they're growing at different rates. So they'll approach that size at different times. Uh, I should have said these, these fish, the, all the study took place over three years, 2017, 2018, and 2019. So I would get different populations each year to put through this suite of tests. Um, and the populations would come from the hatcheries at different sizes. And, and, and so to standardize that, uh, the growth windows are all set to capture growth between about seven grams and up to about 15 grams, after which there are fish large enough to begin metabolic trials. Um, and of course, you take all the big fish out, then your growth data kind of gets all messed up. Um, so that windows growth data and then the metabolic trials are spread out across time, um, both due to the fish growth differences and due to the limitations of our systems. We can only process so many fish at once. Um, so there is a time component here. Um, we included aspects of time in our models and it never came out as significant, but that doesn't mean it's not, there's not an effect of time because these fish are, you know, they're growing and changing as juveniles. Did you aggregate the years that those fish came to you um, in the models or did you try separating them to see if there was a yearly effect? Um, I'm trying to think. I think we definitely checked for year and then we also checked for like fish age. So whether fish were older or younger relative to their hatch date um, and neither of those I'm trying to recall. I don't want to say anything wrong. I'm pretty sure neither of them came out as significant or were either included in the final models. Interesting. Okay. Uh, I think we got a question online. Thinking about how coal would be more challenging to feed restricted fish, did you look at organ development between feed restricted and not? And maybe the higher temperature allowed the fish to develop vital organs faster and better able to survive? Well, that's a great question. Um, so yeah, so the growth data for green sturgeon is, is not my own. It was collected, uh, like I collected my physiology data, you know, a couple months after their growth study. So we shared the same treatments and such, but um, I know they did not look at, Jamie Lennon Co. did not look at organ development. That's a great question. Um, uh, there are, uh, sturgeon are weird fish for a whole bunch of reasons, but the sturgeon show a profound effect of temperature and ration on their morphology. Uh, and so fish that um, are exposed to really cold temperatures develop this like very stunted, it's the only word I can really have for it, stunted shape where they have like really big heads and like really sort of short squat bodies. Um, so given just the anecdotal outward appearance of these fish and the influence of the conditions, it seems that the inward development may also be impacted in ways that would be important to survival. All right, another question online. Any ideas on how to balance the sometimes contrasting needs of endangered species of fish? Seems really challenging, but it's great to have this information in the first place. Great work. Well, thank you. Well, no question in there. Um, yeah, yeah, I think taking this sort of community approach to thermal biology is important to assess how changes to the landscape will affect species A, but also species B, and maybe the food they compete for, and, and, and et cetera, so. All right, I'm looking around the room. Looking for anything online. I do want to point out that um, Ken has put up all of his contact information on the screen. So if you have any follow up questions, um, Ken, are you willing to let us pester you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Please do. Yeah. All right. Um, I think that we're going to wrap it up here and let those folks that are here in Newport travel the snowy roads home. Um, and I just want to say thank you one more time, Ken. I'll try to let the mic hear the clapping. Thank you. <laughs> that was my attempt, but no, they were happy. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. For those online, thank you so much for being here. For those in the room, travel safe home and hope to see you next week. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ken. Thanks. Stay safe. He's still going to be online. Good job, Ken. Oh, hey. Hey. Sorry, um, sorry I went, sorry I went long. I, uh... No, no, not at all. When I gave mine, I think I went up to the point of no questions. So you did a great job. Your slides okay. are beautiful. Um...
we should chat about our various projects soon. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. We can also plan wedding stuff. We can do both, two birds with one stone. Wait, say that one more time, sorry. I, we can plan officiant stuff. <laughs> yeah, for real. Um, science, science and matrimony. Um, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, I'll let you email me and we can find a time. I'm super flexible, so. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> Okay, not cool. The, the well, that sounds good. Um, I'll let you go. I'm going to also head out due to okay. weather and stuff. But yeah, we'll chat soon. All right. Sounds cool. good. Thanks for having me again. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, you thank you so it. much. That was really good. Thank you, Ken. All right. Bye.